So, um, we have a guest for the introduction today, like we did last Thursday. So, um, our guest is Enrico Glarion. Um, Enrico, would you, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, so my background is in um, neuroscience. I did my doctoral studies here at Aalto University. Greetings from Finland. Um, but however, I also had experience in the industry. And for me, kind of from day zero, I started to feel this, you know, it works on my machine. This, <laughs> this, is, this is the kind of sentence that I've heard from, you know, from the, from the very beginning until, you know, a few days ago, maybe even yesterday that we were trying to debug something. So reproducibility, which is exactly this, that it shouldn't just work on your machine, it should work on everyone's machine. Mm -hmm. is uh is very important not just in uh, you know for scientific reasons for academic reasons but also for practical yeah. you know even in the industry it's 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 actually very very important to to make reproducible yeah. workflows so, and code maybe <clears throat> we could back up a bit you already were talking about the <laughs> what we're doing but yeah. yeah so the lessons for today are reproducible research and social coding if i remember correctly yeah. And yeah. are they in that order? Yes. That's yes. Right. Yeah, first okay. Then. Yeah. So, um, you don't need Your to eat is. that. Yeah, the cat found the mic again. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah. So, what are these lessons about then? Or let's see, who am I asking? Yeah, who, who are you asking? Yeah. Then, um, or us? Well, let's say, Matthias, what are they about? What do you say? So reproducibility is about that uh, you or other people can do the same experiments, produce same results, same plots, even um, after a few years or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, then this uh, social coding is uh, more about um, how to re reuse other people's code. So we talk about licensing and, and that sort of things. Yeah. So the reason we invited Enrico here today for the icebreaker is that he's done all kinds of um, work for reproducible research at our university. So what kind of work would you say you've done? Like, what what do you talk about? Yeah, I think for me, it started from a passion and also kind of in, in the basics of the scientific method, producing reproducible science is like, a, you know, part of the scientific method. And so I got more interested in this, in this type of issues when I started my PhD. And then later it, it kind of, bloom the, the so-called reproducibility crisis which uh, you will find also later in the in the lesson material and so this kind of made me think you know maybe we should do something about it so it, it's it's nice that you know we were not alone feeling this crisis many other fields of science felt the same crisis and so we we, we just started teaching how to make the you know your workflow analysis work for more reproducible although reproducibility i don't know how much here of course the, the focus is more on the so-called computational reproducibility but what i teach sometimes is also the so-called responsible conduct of research because sometimes it's it, it's more about the theory the science that is not mm -hmm. reproducible i might be able to reproduce your exact numbers but the actual you know research question might not be reproducible so of course there it goes more how can i say philosophical <laughs> in, a, in a in a way yeah but um so these are the type of daily issues that i'm that i'm trying to help yeah. researchers with so, so yeah these... so oh, i think on. the, the uh, reproducibility means different things in different fields of science in like in practice if you think yeah so 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 these philosophical reproducibility things what are they about and there's also a question hackmd what does it mean reproducibility crisis 
So, well, I could briefly mention that the 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 issue with not with all fields of science, but many fields of science, like medical sciences, they need to um, test for an hypothesis, and often they they need to set some whatever significant value. And often there is all sorts of biases to reach these, you know, significant values or all sorts of methodological choices that then other people are not able to, to reproduce. So in my opinion, today's lesson is, is maybe, I mean, maybe of course I'm biased here, but maybe this is the most important lesson because uh, if you want to show that your research, that your research question is reproducible, then you want to start from, you know, reproducing the actual numbers that you that you can use you know to back up your research question and then in general you know other people will maybe use other data for a similar question or you know diff similar code and same data so this this type of how can i say they they call it robustness mm -hmm. of the result which it's it, it kind of goes beyond the computational reproducibility it goes most towards this philosophical reproducibility if you want if you want an example for physics that um, the galileo experiment is a very reproducible experiment where he dropped the 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 ball from the tower tower of pisa mm -hmm. and then and then estimated the the gravitational whatever is that g accelerations so other people could you know reproduce those those findings and that's that's that that's basically when a law is is born <laughs> Yeah. So I guess like non-reproducible research is you say this COVID vaccine works and then a year later they're like, okay, actually we do the experiments over and over again and it doesn't. And that's, yeah. you lose all kinds of confidence in science. Exactly. And like my yeah, faith. Like it's like a basic notion in science that you other people has to be able to validate your results and by making your research reproducible you make also the validation way easier yeah can i ask like, a question to Aniko or and others um can you hear me yeah, yeah. sure yeah Go ahead. good um so you talked about the reproducibility crisis and and now we have awareness about it we have I think we have the tools, we have training, that's why we are here. But would you say that, is it getting better or worse? Oh, I mean, is the crisis decreasing or increasing? Are the, are the computations these days, in your experience, more reproducible than 10 years ago? Is it less reproducible? What's your observation? I would say that it's not going to go away. Maybe we can, you know, make easier this uh, you know reproducing the computations maybe you know we can make also our own life easier because in in one year i'm able to reproduce what i'm what i'm working on today but i think that the issue is like um it's a larger issue that it, it goes maybe beyond this this workshop but it's, it's the issue that um publication are associated with the uh, career advancement and so you want to publish more than your whatever competitors and that of course will introduce some sort of bias i'm not saying that people cheat to publish more but um, you know there are all sorts of unconscious biases that people might use to you know take advantage of this and those foster the the reproducibility crisis so people should basically stop being selfish and work in large <laughs> projects if if it's if it's a very large project between many many research groups you know each research group can collect a subset of the data set each can analyze each other data so you know there are good good you know, how can i wait new new ways of doing science that is more for the benefit of science rather than for the benefit of the individuals but of course it's important to start with you know with yourself making sure that you can rerun your script in six months or in six years if they are yeah. very important yeah. Like my favorite non-reproducibility mechanism is when someone says, oh, I'm trying to do these paper revisions, but I can't make the same figures I made last time, which, you know, how much doubt does that throw on everything, really? <laughs> so this is not just theoretical for other people, but 
it would be so useful for everyone to make their own work more reproducible. Something so, that I very found very, very useful is that when I start a new project from day zero, I have in mind that this has to be reproducible, which means that from day zero, I start taking notes so that someone yeah. else, you know, if it's not me, if it's the future me or someone else, you know, can already yeah. reproduce, pick it up where I left it or, or, or try to run the same things. Yeah. So do you, when you start a new project, do you also try to use some of the strategies we're going to use, um, like we're going to learn about today? like snake make or whatever to make your whole analysis reproducible with a single command. Yeah, actually you... to be, I, I think that there is this section for on today that you will see soon um, about the readme file. Mm -hmm. And what I start is writing the comments kind of, writing okay. the, the readme file with the pipeline in the, in the readme file, and then maybe let it rest for a few days yeah. and then revise. And then when I'm happy with the, with the plan, then it's just a matter of, you know, Okay. Open, whether it's snake make or bash script or okay so so you start with some really low tech thing and once you realize you're actually doing it yeah like it's the right thing then you do the automation of it somehow yeah in general sense. i find it very useful even when writing code that the first thing i write are the comments mm -hmm. so that it I, I just need to fill in you know yeah whatever is needed between the comments <laughs> yeah okay um, so the next thing I wanted to ask was about licenses and so on. So that will be the second lesson of today. So it's called social coding, but a lot of it is about how we can take code from others and give code to others. Uh, and licenses are part of that. So do you have any thoughts or stories on that topic? Well, I mean, I have a, general, maybe I mean, we, on an ideal point of view, someone might think that having the best license attached to your code can, you know, grant success, but also openness and, uh, you know, all sorts of good things. But then in practice, I'm, I mean, I don't want to be pessimistic but in practice if if the code is so good you can put the most strict license the the big players would still you know steal your code or rewrite in in a in, in a way that they can't that they you that you can't claim that they stole your code so in, in the end what is important is to make it easier for other scientists to to reuse it so we will of course you will discuss later more on the different licenses but the more open licenses are those that you know are easier for others to reuse and and in some cases they even you know make new how can i say communities form out of a out of a project like like um, maran was saying last last week that the mne project was just a small set of set of developers but then they had a license they had an open community and, and it grew and it grew and now there's you know hundreds of contributors and um, and thousands of users so yeah Okay, well, we're about halfway through our intro time. So maybe, well, I guess Enrico can keep watching the HackMD if there's any more questions. Oh, I have one final question. How's the in-person Alto University session going? Do you have a yeah, lot of imagine. people there? This time people were very enthusiastic and we got lots of presents. I don't know if it's also the cookies because I bought very juicy <laughs> yeah. chocolate chips cookie. <laughs> Maybe those help. I bought yeah. more today. Yeah. So, but in, but in general, it's it it, it it it's also interesting. There was also a subgroup that they they're using one of the small meeting rooms here. Uh, so, with, with their own, uh, you know, leader okay. expert leader. So, so, like a sub in person session in an in person exactly. session. Okay. So, if you don't know Enrico's leading one of the in-person rooms. So right outside the room he's in now is a bunch of people doing code refinery together. So the model works. Yeah. Okay, great. Right. So with Thank that, you. thanks for coming. And I have a few more words and then we will begin. So yes, if you are just joining now, 
um, Code Refinery has been going on for, what's it, uh, well, one week already. So last week we talked about version control, so basically Git a lot. And this week you could look at it as two ways. One is we're learning a bunch of other skills that are useful for programming, or two is we're getting a bunch of hands-on experience using version control for real projects. So take your pick. The topics of the week include reproducible research, social coding, Jupyter documentation, testing, and modular code development. And some of these are really good and fun lessons. Um, I guess you already know, but you're completely welcome to join for this week and invite anyone else who would like to drop by. Um, how to attend? Well, if you're watching this, you probably know it's a live stream. So we're here, we talk, there's different breaks for exercises where we mute the stream, you can do some work, take a break, whatever, and then we come back at a certain time. This thing you're seeing on the screen is the collaborative document. Um, it's a link on note.coderfinder.org. You get it if you register, and it's not too late to register. In fact, please do because that helps our reporting and things like that. If you look up at the top, there's a way to move to edit mode. And this is what we use as our Q&A. So you see us here teaching, well, not us, so Radovan and Matthias. Um, but we also have a whole bunch of other people in the background who are reading this and answering the questions. So basically you can um, get help at any time. Uh, let's see. So there are some things that could go wrong. So mm, let's see what are the most. So maybe the one I'll most mention is information overload. So there's so much things going on in this course. There'll be so many questions which are being asked here, as you can already see down here. We had well over 100, perhaps approaching 200 questions per day. So if it's too much to read, my suggestion is don't read it. It'll be archived later for the end, so you can always refer to it later. Also, Twitch and YouTube store these videos afterwards. So if thing you get overloaded, don't worry, just relax, and you can catch up later. That's one of the points of being open. Um, in case the stream suddenly dies, then you can... Well, just wait. That means my computer crashed somehow. So wait around five minutes and it will be back. Um, okay, my cat is opening the door to go out. Um, How about if the hack, uh, if the collaborative document, the hedgehog uh, starts to go sluggish or something? Uh, yeah. So in that case, we will shorten it. So at the top, there is a archive link. So basically when it gets too long, we move the older questions here and then it usually gets a little bit better. So we recommend you to leave the, um, the doc in view mode when you're not actively editing it. We think that improves the performance. But if you flip it to edit mode once and then view mode again, it will be live updating even in view mode like you see here. Um, any other major problems that might come up. If there's anything wrong, like you can't see or the wrong screen is being shared or something is being um, covered on the screen or the volumes are bad, then let us know right away. So you can do that in the bottom of the doc and it will um, and we'll notice and react to it. Also, some of us in the background will be editing the doc and if we see an important question there, we'll raise it by voice to people immediately. Okay, should we begin? I think all the rest we can figure out. Yeah, sure. Okay, great. So with that, I will go off and see you later then.
Thanks, Richard, for the introduction and welcome, everybody. And we should maybe start by introducing ourselves. Not everybody was here last week um, and I will start. My name is Hadovan Bast. I work in Tromsø, Northern Norway. Uh, I'm with, with Code Refinery working on training since many years, since six, six years. I enjoy it a lot. Um, in my other work, I really enjoy working on research software engineering teaching researchers in programming and really helping people with computing and programming. And today with me is uh, Matthias. Maybe you can say a few words. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Matthias Jääskeläinen. Uh, I work at CSC Finland and uh, also with Code Refinery. I've been helping to organize this event in the background. And this is first time in the live stream teaching, co-teaching. So thank you for the opportunity here. And uh, I'm really excited to see how this turns out. And I might have some questions during the lesson. I think it's a, a nice way of co-teaching that we can ask each other questions during the, during the way. Yeah, I so much look forward to today. Um, we will try to keep it really conversational. The topic of today is sharing, sharing code with, with our future selves, with other people. Um, first, practically what to expect today. Um, also to prepare the the team leads. Um, in the first lesson, you can expect two exercise blocks. There will be two exercise blocks times 20 minutes. Um, one will be before our first break. Uh, the second one will be after our first break. You can expect uh, there will be three breaks today, times 10 minutes. I also, I'm not sure I'm sharing screen, maybe. Or... Yeah, yeah, it shows. Yeah, I am. I, I also wanted to let you know that in our, in our collaborative document at the bottom, something we will try for the first time is we will try to put at the bottom of the document always where are we currently in the material so that because there are so many things to watch if you get lost or distracted or you're you are away for a few minutes you see where we are and we we ask you to please ask questions always always at the bottom of the document just above this line because this is the place where, that we'll be watching and thanks a lot for keeping already the questions coming in here so with Matthias, we will watch these questions. We will we will talk about these. Um, and now here you can also find today's material if you follow this link. Let's see what we see. It's this page. 